Uh, so, Gaurav, uh, thank you so much for uh, doing the interview with us. Uh, can you tell us, uh, you know, who you are and what you, you know, what your background is a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Langdon. First of all, uh, great to be here. Definitely a unique situation for me to be in this bright red car on a sunny day yeah, here in yeah. Amsterdam. It's gorgeous so out, isn't it? Okay. This, is, this is actually quite and amazing. You can, you can see the clouds in the sky. <laughs> that is indeed true. <laughs> uh, is it, what's the theme this time? Isn't it like let uh, Kubernetes bloom or something? Oh, but, yeah, uh, yeah, that rings yeah. a bell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, so sorry, back to your question. So yeah. I'm, uh, I'm Gaurav Rishi. I'm the VP of product and look at cloud native partnerships here at uh, Kirsten Bavim, if in case uh, people can see the logo out here. Mm -hmm. So very much uh, looking forward to this. Okay. So what does that mean that you kind of do? Um, you know, obviously, <laughs> I think a lot of people are familiar with kind of helping to drive product, but what does the kind of partnership side mean to you? You know, so I, this is super exciting for me because yeah. uh, living inside the cloud native ecosystem, what, first of all, we as a company, Kirsten Bavim, do is three key things use cases. One is we do Kubernetes application backup and recovery. Mm -hmm. We do disaster recovery and we do application mobility. I can you know, explain yeah. each one of them. But uh, to get any of these things going, you need to sort of work in the ecosystem. You need to make sure you are working with the storage partners so you can actually mm -hmm. back up your data. You need to make sure that you're working with all of the Kubernetes distributions so that people have their freedom of choice whether it's managed services or whether it's on-premises self-managed like OpenShift, right. as well as uh, you need to work in the context of security because backup turns out to be your last line of defense. And so that's super critical too. So that's, that's really going ahead and making sure we can make all of these technology pieces come to life in a way that makes it super simple for people and getting all the companies to work together. So that's really a part of my job while you know we help define the product and build it which obviously the smart engineers at Kasten do. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think kind of the crux of cloud native, um, I mean, it's kind of true in more traditional application environments as well, but a cloud native is all about, you know, kind of service-oriented architecture, right? It's all about connecting all the pieces together to actually get to where your application is going. Um, and I think that's one of the hardest things to manage, and I think that the you know, what maybe companies like yours bring to the table, but also companies like Red Hat bring to the table is is like um, providing me as a customer or a user, like kind of a guidance on, yeah. on which ones work together well, um, which is, uh, you know, a difficult thing to figure out on kind of your own without a lot of trial and error, which, yeah. you know, um, is, uh, you know, less than fun. A lot no, of you know, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting you say that because I actually remember blogging about this uh, up front when I joined... Uh, Kasten and the cloud native community, which was uh, simplicity and freedom of choice. And I know it gets a little philosophical, but mm -hmm. the point is, on one hand, you can argue that, hey, look, if you have a lot of choice, things become complex, it's hard to choose, mm -hmm. how do you get things to work? Um, and sometimes people can confuse that by saying, let's go restrict the choice, so that it becomes sort of simple. Mm -hmm. But I think the right answer is, how do you still keep that choice, but maybe guide people so that there is indeed a way where they feel confident of being able to go ahead and pick the medium which helps meet their requirements. So, right. so I think that's very much what we do. We want people to be able to choose the best storage infrastructure, choose the best deployment model, whether it's out to the edges in the cloud, hybrid, etc. But at the same time, make sure the data has the freedom and can sort of move around because that's very much how I think most of the deployments today are and are ramping up. So, right. so right. that's uh, that's yeah, that's philosophical but also very much true to what we are seeing today yeah I mean I think the you know we, we've started here at terms like uh, opinionated yeah a lot um, and I'm a big fan of the opinionated kind of solution that allows for change right um, because you know not every it doesn't always fit but at the same time getting it kind of up and running in you know the way that we know kind of works the best uh, starts you know is a lot easier starting point than you know having to figure out all the tools um, all the way along so yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a fan. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think I think simplicity is needed, and especially in this environment. I mean, I think I I, I know you probably know the stats, but it amazes me every time we come for the Kubernetes uh, event. Majority of the people are attending Kubernetes for the very first time, mm -hmm. which means that they are actually new relatively to the ecosystem. Right. And so you cannot expect them to be black belts uh, right. on on, right. on day one. And so I think as organizations sort of scale up their workloads they are looking for, like you said, the opinionated 
ways of being able to work so that they can get the advantages that Kubernetes has promised and is actually delivering, right. but, uh, but do it in a simple way. And that's very much, I think, how we at Gaston also approach it. Well, I mean, even, even if you're in this space all the time, it, uh, like keeping track of you know, the plethora of projects is, is really tough, right? You know? <laughs> yes. Um, in, uh, like I was one of the other people I interviewing um, is uh, actually working on the like cloud native uh, glossary as well as like trying to put together. Uh, there's another uh, CNCF um, kind of project summary map, mm -hmm. um, you know. So uh, to try to get you know some, make it a little clearer what's what really is going on. Um, yeah, it might be easier to navigate the streets of Amsterdam with a cyclist than it is to <laughs> at times navigate the CNCF landscape. I hear you. I don't uh, know if I go so. quite that far. All right. Uh, okay. Yeah. Fine. I know uh, I was pushing it. It, it, just, it is <laughs> exciting uh, being out here. Although, Both are exciting. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I totally hear you. Um, but you do uh, your organization does do um, a fair amount of open source kind of contribution, um, and the project you were talking about specifically, that I thought was really interesting was uh, Navigate. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So, yeah, no, I mean, to your larger point, I think we are definitely, you know, big sponsors of not only the KubeCon type events, but also our active contributors to a variety mm -hmm. of open source projects. So, so I can probably, and depending on where customers and the community members are in their journey to adopting Kubernetes, there's something that, you know, we see as a fit for them. So, so specifically around Navigate, which is Navi G with a letter uh, or a number eight behind mm -hmm. it, is is an exciting one. And I think the you know the thesis behind it really started was, on one hand, Helm is amazing, right? I mean, it's a collection of YAML files, helps you have these in a, in a chart, helps you do package management, deploy applications, but it also comes with a variety of challenges, right? As your applications and your cloud native applications become more complex to your earlier point, mm -hmm. um, there are a lot more configuration parameters that you need to go ahead and set, right? And it it is very easy to lose yourself into these YAML files, authoring them, and different charts and different aspects of those YAML files might not appeal to the same um, domain owners. So your developers might care about some configuration parameters, your operations teams might care about a different set of parameters, and, and things can get out of whack and complex to manage really quickly, right? Mm -hmm. and, and and we noticed that when we were dealing with our customers. And so, uh, and K10, which is our product, also is a cloud native application, and you know we started seeing some of those complexities ourselves too. So Navigate was born from that problem, um, and to see if there's a way to solve that. And so what it allows you to do is essentially gives you a simple um, you know user interface where you can go ahead and actually get your variables. On one side, and uh, and the uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was like, this, <laughs> this is. It's uh, a little hard to see them when you're kind of this low. This low uh, on yeah. this uh, yeah. on this race car. I'm, yeah. I, I don't know if the audience can actually see how cool right, the car is, right. but but yeah, no, it's 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 very cool. And there's the canal on this side. Well, one of the, one of the people I interviewed earlier commented that uh, you know maybe it's because I'm not like sitting low enough and and uh, ah. you know like truly uh, the you know, doing the, the race car experience, you know, with their economy mode and, you know, driving on city streets, which you is mean, probably you, a good thing. You, you should be in, the, in a bicycle here, and uh, that's <laughs> yeah, how the interview yeah. should happen. Yeah, All well, right, we, nah, we talked that. about that, but have you ever seen a two-person <laughs> bicycle that was not, like, front back, right? And then you'd also have to do all the pedaling, right? Uh, so that might be tough on the talking. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, sorry, but uh, no, I think we got, uh, we got lost in that. So, yeah, so Navigate cool. allows you to sort of very uh, easily be able to go ahead and get a list of, think of it as values and parameters, mm -hmm. and so you can go ahead and get your um, applications configured in a way where you know what might be the parameters, what the value for that is, set it up, and it in turn will go ahead and generate the chart for you, right? Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. that, the, uh, and that turns out to be something that's super useful because once you get your perfect chart, you've got this, it's right. easy to understand, but then it can be reused too, right. and you can apply it across a variety of templates. So that's in fact how, if you want to go to install at caston.io, for example, that's what we use under the covers to go ahead and make it easy to design, design your, your and particular configure. deployment. Exactly, basically. exactly. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's something that we are excited about. We are uh, definitely seeing you know, the community sort of saying, okay, that's that's interesting, and so I think events like this 
where we've got everybody from various industries come in and talk about it, can help sort of contribute to it and take it to the next level. Yeah. And there's so much more you can do, right? I right, mean, whether it's right. about parameter validation uh, or things of that nature, I think those are all very much a part of it. So, so that's what Navigate is, but yeah. there are a bunch of other projects like you know, Cubester and we've got Cube Campus, which is a learning platform, and we've got Canister, and I'm happy to talk about that too. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, what, what you know, what do you think is the you know the the interesting you know things like Canister or whatever you know you're doing a lot of contributions to um, you know these open source projects, and it sounds like you're contributing to them, like you're you're kind of creating them and contributing to them because of of the need that you have uh, that you think others might share. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, you were asking me this question earlier, uh, I know just before we hopped into the car about, you know, why is, uh, why is data protection important right now, right? Yeah, why, and, basically it's like, you know, in Kubernetes land, right, um, you know, I was, like I said, not, maybe not a year ago, but a year ago, right, there was not very many uh, organizations that were offering, you know, solutions in the, you know, kind of backup data protection, et cetera, space. Um, but it seemed like there are a fair number of them this yeah. year or this, you know, event. Um, and so what do you think has shown that growth or where do you think that growth might have come from? Yeah, so I think, um, let, let me see if I can draw an analog given that we are on a journey here. So yeah, right, maybe, right. maybe, maybe the stops to that is, so I, I like to joke that Kubernetes is a, you know, eight or a nine year young system mm -hmm. uh, right now. The ecosystem is still developing, the technologies are in production, but there's so much innovation still going on. So if I really had to rewind, the initial years of uh, Kubernetes, you had this whole paradigm around, hey, pets and cattle, um, you know, stateless systems, right? Yep. And, and you know, as a, as a vegetarian, that uh, was not very appealing, the whole analog around pets I had and a, cattle. Um, an ecologist, a <laughs> friend of mine who was a, 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 like an open shift advocate a long time ago, uh, he, he decided that it should be ants and elephants. Um, you <laughs> Actually, know. yeah, I do need to meet this ecologist. Yeah, All right, right. So, okay. Uh, I, 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 I hear you, I can empathize uh, with a that. A little shout out to Steve-O <laughs> on Twitter. All right, um, very cool. Yeah. I, uh, good job, Steve-O. I think that, was, that would have been a much better way to yeah. term it. But for whatever reason, that stuck, and that was a good way to start the system, you had very simple applications which didn't have state. But mm -hmm. think about any application, whether it's your banking application, shopping card application, you need to have state. You need to have data which is generated as a result of you shopping or as a result of you hopefully earning money or spending money. And right. you need to store that somewhere. And, um, and so state is going to exist. And you have the other thing which sort of went and um, came alive in the cloud native development pattern, which was what we call polyglot persistence, which was essentially just a fancy way of saying a simple application under the covers uses a variety of data services, whether it's SQL, NoSQL, messaging queues, streaming databases. The point is you have not a single relational database which used to be in the monolith mm -hmm. or the non-cloud native world. You now have moved to a cloud native application with microservices and multiple data services under the covers. So if I kind of now fast forward 10 years into the journey, we actually have databases as the most popular workload running on Kubernetes, mm. right? So if you mm -hmm. kind of go look at your Datadog report, which is not a survey, but actually going and looking into what's running in these uh, containers across uh, you know, a billion plus of them, it turns out that it's usually things like PostgreSQL and you know, Mongo and things of that nature. So, uh, so that's what's happened, first of all. You've had a huge amount of state come in and as soon as you have state, you need to make sure that you're actually able to protect yourself in case there are failures, and that could be you know, attacks from things like ransomware, right. or there could be mistakes that people made by misconfiguring, et cetera, and so you need to see, be able to go ahead and recover, and that's what brings up data protection as a here and now issue, right? That's really what's happening. And this makes me ask the question, are we lost? I see you looking at the map. <laughs> um, not entirely. I okay. just, uh, the, the map wasn't kind of keeping up with uh, where I wanted to go. Uh, so I just changed it so that it's now going to follow it a little better. Um, this is a, this is a, this is, I, I think I recognize the street. So this is a cool place to yeah. be actually, either which way. It's one of the major ones. There's a canal right, on right. either side. Yeah. 
Uh, so I actually think this is part of my route. It's just uh, I wasn't actually sure where the next turn was. Okay. Uh, so no that's why I was uh, checking it out. Um, so uh, so one of the things that I actually think has also been really interesting, kind of the cloud native world, uh, even even in more traditional apps that are not actually doing kind of the real cloud native thing, um, the number of types of databases that is in every application is like ridiculous. You know, like the, you know, a data, uh, yeah. you know, a, a, an, an, an application used to be just a relational database behind it, but now it's got, you know, a, you know, some sort of name value pattern, no SQL database, right? Yeah. It also has like a, you know, a document store, no SQL database. It also has a relational database and maybe some others. Yeah. Um, and I think that's been also really interesting. So not only do you have the complexity of, you know, uh, typical kind of data backup, but now you have to do it in like all these different ways because all these tools do their persistent differently, and they um, and they also have different styles of um, you know, as you call it. I'm actually, I don't know, I, I don't know why the term never really occurred to me, but data protection, yeah. um, you know, is is even more complex, right, than than it would be traditionally because you have so many different uh, kind of crazy yeah. options around. Uh, how that data is being persisted. Yeah, no, I'm actually, um, you know, just to build on that point, not only is data protection important because of the reasons we talked about where you on one hand have a lot more attack vectors and oh, you know, backup right. turns out yeah. to be your last line of defense. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, the makeup of your applications under the covers have a lot of this polyglot persistence point that we were making. But you know, when you actually look at the techniques of doing data protection or things like being able to take backups, you can, you know, as software developers or former software developers, I mean, I think we all love our stack diagrams and layers of <laughs> operation, yeah. but, uh, um, but you know you can you can you can work at the storage layer, right? So you can do snapshots. So you can work with block file uh, or object stores and say, look, I need to go take a quick snapshot of that, and that that works fine in some cases. But you also might need to go ahead and work at a layer above, which is at the database level, which we call logical backups. Mm -hmm. And the reason you might want to do that is for some applications it's not sufficient to get the kind of consistency a snapshot might give you because you might have still things that are in memory, haven't been flushed out oh, into disk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you lose that, yeah. that could be that million dollar uh, sale you made. Right. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. you, you don't want that to be, uh, to be lost. And so that's the reason if you're using, for example, Postgres as a database, you might be wanting to exercise things like PG Dump, which is a mm -hmm. tool that might come with it. And to your point, because you have 300 plus databases, mm -hmm. and that's growing actually, uh, you have 300 different ways of being able to use these logical database exactly. tools. Yeah. So I think one of the things which uh, uh, you know we at Caston do really well, and I can talk about what we're doing together with the community with projects like Canister in that context, is to be able to say, look, we want to give you a simple way, but still maintain that freedom of choice to be able to go pick and choose any database that solves your problem. But when it comes to backup, we'll go ahead and create these templates. We've mm -hmm. already gone ahead and configured that under the covers, you can choose whether to use snapshot-based backups or logical database-based backups. And we go ahead and under the covers, use the native tools that the database vendors at times have gone ahead and created. Right, right. And then the other sort of vector to this is also that we are seeing people employ databases in Kubernetes clusters, and mm -hmm. then they're also using databases as managed database as a service. So think about right, Amazon right. RDS, yep. for example, or MongoDB, Atlas, yep. uh, and so on. And and both are good, right? Depending on the needs, you might decide option A or B, and A right, and B right. also in some cases. And so you also want your backup to work across both those cases, which mm -hmm. is uh, what we do. And so how canister fits in, which is again an open source project, is it gets a little more involved and I know we are navigating through the streets here, right, but, yeah. uh, but, but it's interesting because think about going ahead and doing a backup. You might have multiple replicas running. What you mm -hmm. might want to go ahead and do is say, look, I want to have an order of operations in terms of making sure, scale it down, go act on replica number two, Make sure you use these tools so you have pre-hooks and post-hooks in our terminology to be able to create these blueprints for certain types of databases. Right. And then when right. the time comes for recovery, these order of operations are even more important because it might be that your application requires microservice 2 
to come up only after microservice right. one has been right. rehydrated, right? right. So, yeah. so what Canister allows you to do is create these blueprints, which mm -hmm. can be extended or can be authored up front for your applications, which have under the covers various types of data services, and then be able to define these order of operations. But these order of operations also includes a call out into the database native tools like PG Dump, et cetera, right. so that it becomes super easy for you. So, so. Do, you, do you foresee Canister as, as like kind of like a complete disaster recovery kind of uh, orchestrator, for lack of a better term, or is it pretty much purely focused on data? I mean, data is obviously an important part, but not the only part of, uh, you know, kind of a recovery scenario. Yeah. No, so it's a great question. So I think the way we've got Canister right now and the way we envision it is essentially Canister plays a really important part in doing what I just defined, which is yeah. you know the blueprint aspect of it. But if you had to go ahead and think about backup and disaster recovery, yeah. there's so many other aspects that are needed. So for right. example, you need to go ahead and not only discover all the applications that first of all are running in your cluster, mm -hmm. then you need to go ahead and define what should be the policies, how often should they be backed up, right? Mm -hmm. Then you need to go ahead and define, well, how long should they be kept? Because you don't want to keep increasing your storage bill, you need to go and say my retention policy is seven years or whatever, or 30 days, and after that time, go and delete it, or move it from uh, you know, this object store to a, maybe a coal glacier or things of that yeah. nature. Yeah. So there are all these other attributes, mm -hmm. and so that's where we have Kasten K10 as a co-product, which does a lot of that work, Mm -hmm. But for some of the key critical tasks, it uses Canister to to be able to define these blueprints. Right. So the problem we are trying to solve with that and strike this healthy balance is we want our partners, both system integrators as well as customers, to be able to not wait for a release from us to be able to say, hey, my application looks like this and my order of operations need to be ABC. Right give me a new release for that, I should be able to go and work at my own pace mm -hmm. and across my own deployment model. And so that's the way we see Canister evolving and we keep getting it richer and it surprises us. At times the customers and community members who've used it and built their own things and yeah. you know wrapped it with other kinds of scheduling algorithms and that's all very good. Right. And the way we see it at Cast and K10, uh, mm -hmm. usage is to be able to continue to enrich it so it becomes easier for you to be able to write these blueprints as well as have them surfaced up so it comes back to that simplicity point right, we started right. with. Yeah. So one thing I wanted to ask you, because you were talking about the, the complexity of backup and you know data protection, remember, is that um, you know there's this I wouldn't say new, but it's getting it's getting more prevalent concept of uh, like eventual consistency. Um, and I'm curious to know like do do some of the tools you're describing kind of help somebody solve uh, you know when you when you have eventual consistency like is the data you know like how do you how do you deal with uh, backups and recovery and deal with the fact that um, you yeah. know it's eventually consistent yeah no so look I mean and, and this goes back to that point around you were making about databases themselves are evolving in their architecture mm -hmm. and you know not only are they segmented based on are they columnar or are they I mean, you're the professor, so yeah, right, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'll leave that part to you to expand. But my point is we, we see a diversity of those. But what we are also seeing uh, hand in glove with that is uh, operator-based patterns coming up by these database vendors themselves who mm -hmm. know best to go ahead and define how to do the backup based on the behavior of eventual consistency or not, right? right? right. And so, so I think our design and philosophical approach, I just gave a simple example of saying, hey, look, when it comes to Postgres, we could go ahead and employ... Uh, you know, PG dump. Right. But right. for example, if you take Cassandra, there is also something called K8Sandra, which is another open source sort of uh, operator framework which uh, we've integrated into that hides the complexity of being able to go ahead and work in such environments. And that's a pattern that we are seeing come up with a variety of, um, you know, database vendors, whether it's people like EDB or Mongo or so on. Right. And so that's that's how we expect to work at that logical level, yeah, even yeah. in this kind of environment. Well, it's been one of the things with databases, right, is that databases had to scale, um, you know, in in their, like, like, at all, right, well before most of the rest of the software environment kind of needed to. Um, and so, as a result, you know, uh, database you know, creators, like developers or whatever, like they know, for example, like the best way for their application to scale and, and kind of containerization of those was often not a great idea because you, 
you were like kind of trying to know better than the database vendor. Um, and so the database yeah. vendors are, are also now going kind of more containerized and I think they're doing, um, you know, they're doing a good job of that. And, you know, this is not a fault at all. It's just that a lot of the times, particularly with something as sophisticated as data, uh, you know, and a database or, you know, whatever it is, um, it's, it's, it's even more important to rely on the authors of that software system to kind of tell you exactly. how to work That's exactly with right. it. That's um, exactly right. You know, because like at the end of the day, you know, Apache, you know, or HTTPD, right? Is it's a pretty simple system. You know, I mean, it's a really good piece of code and all that other stuff. But like at the end of the day, it doesn't. Um, you know, it kind of you can kind of just start it and stop it, right? Um, whereas a database has so many other kind of yeah. moving parts. And I think that that's a like your philosophy is a good one where you're kind of saying, okay, we we hope you know that you as the author of this software know the best way to provide right. the data, and then we can go off and do what we do well, which is the you know the kind of right. backup and restore and all that jazz. But the the detail is like you know you separation of concerns where hey, that's exactly the you way. folks yeah. know this part well, and we know yeah. this part well. Let's work it together yeah. instead of trying to take over. Yeah, and I think there's another sort of um, sort of bridging uh, open source project, which probably is worth mentioning too, which is Copia. So, mm -hmm. you know, data movement, once you've got the backup process, et cetera, you've got some things in, so you have persistent volume, you need to usually move them somewhere so that it's more than just a snapshot because that's a bad idea for a backup. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, your storage system can fail uh, and, and so on. So typically people would go ahead and say, look, let me go ahead and make sure I take a backup, whether at the storage layer or at the logical level, but then move all of that content for safeguarding purposes using what we call the three, two, one rule, right? Which is like three copies, two different types oh, of media, yeah, one okay. offsite, so that you can protect yourself. Um, and now you need to go ahead and do a lot of uh, work to make sure you are efficiently and securely moving that data out into that place, which typically turns out to be an object storage mm -hmm. uh, location, and at times it's you know increasingly in the clouds, um, right? Whether it's a Blob Store on the Azure side or whether it's uh, S3, etc. And so, in that context, we've also been contributing a lot in what we call uh, Copia, um, mm -hmm. which is a data mover, and that's really interesting as a project too. And that's sort of built on the serverless design type principles, and that's um, quite interesting as an innovation project also that started a few, many years ago actually, and now it's obviously in production with some of the world's largest companies using that as a result of using Kasten. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's another interesting hand and glove project between what we see with Canister and Copia mm -hmm. as you sort of evolve towards this data protection journey, right? So, yeah, yeah. So, I, yeah so I think just to complete the analog, I mean, you know, as, as you come into KubeCon, if you've come in for the first time, we've got open source sort of initiatives like Cube Campus, where you can come and learn. In fact, there was a lab yesterday where a ton of people had signed up. You could go ahead and just learn about Kubernetes, right? Mm -hmm. No strings attached. It's, it's, it's a way of sort of giving to the community, making sure they're educated. And that's, that's, a, that's a great initiative. The second one is like, let's say you've gone ahead and started creating your first few applications. You run into some of these practical problems we were talking about with things like Helm. Mm -hmm. You've got projects like Navigate. Now let's say you've gone ahead, been able to deploy those applications, things are working fine. What we've also realized is people come and say, hey, well, I need projects, and I'll put a plug-in for another one, which is Kubester, yep. which is our way of going ahead and saying, well, I don't know, there's so many different storage environments in my, um, in my little cluster or in my set of clusters or hybrid environments can something go ahead and figure out what are these different storage environments there, first of all, just, just the auditing aspect yeah, and discovery yeah. aspect. Once I've got that going, can you go ahead and sort of just make sure that they are actually okay with being able to go ahead and do things like backups? Do they even support the snapshot APIs uh, You know that uh, some vendors don't support even today, the legacy ones? Though, of course, that's uh, quite corrected at this point of time or other right drivers installed and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So in that context, you also want a tool which can not only discover your environment, but can go ahead and validate that you can actually have all of these pieces in, and then maybe run some performance tests. Maybe it's an FIO or something, right? Just right. to just to get that, and that's exactly what uh, projects like Kubester do um, for the environment. And then once you've got that in, 
I think data protection comes in next as a stop so that you have your last line of defense. And having said that, sounds like we've reached yeah, a we, stop. Yeah, we've gotten uh, to the end of our journey. Uh, yeah, so um, the last line of defense. There you go. Thank you uh, uh, so much for uh, being here. We you know, we really like doing these. We think they're fun. Uh, hopefully the uh, driving was not too harrowing. For no, you. this is a fantastic car, yeah, and yeah. the city is obviously beautiful yeah, and good yeah. company. So yeah, yeah, thank you very much. It. And I can talk about data protection for a long time. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I know a, you, I know you want to stop. It's helpful when you get into a space. You know, you're always <laughs> like, you know, oh, there's so much more we can talk about.